Chapter 16, Evolution and Diversity of Plants. The book of Matthew says you will know them by the fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So if you will recall, at the beginning of the semester, one of the topics that we discussed was autotrophs versus heterotrophs. And if you will recall, heterotrophs are those organisms that are consumers. In other words, they need to consume their food. Whereas autotrophs are producers, they can produce their own food. So green plants are producers. They produce food that is consumed by other organisms. They produce this food via a process called photosynthesis, which we have talked about photosynthesis numerous times. Photosynthesis requires sunlight, which is the energy portion of the process, water and carbon dioxide. We also discussed the fact that oxygen is a waste product of photosynthesis. So again, the process of photosynthesis requires energy in the form of sunlight, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, water from the ground usually, and the end result is glucose. So glucose is a food that is produced by autotrophs, these plants. The waste product of photosynthesis is oxygen. At the beginning of the semester during the first lecture, we also talked about domains of life. We identified three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We also stated that bacteria and archaea were similar to each other in that had similar characteristics in that they were prokaryotes, which means that they do not have a true nucleus. Whereas the domain of eukarya, generally these are multicellular organisms, but there are some unicellular or single cells, and animals, fungi, plants, and protista fall under this category of eukarya, the eukaryotes that possess true nuclei. In the first lecture, we also talked a little bit about taxonomy and how various organisms are named in kingdom, phylum, etc. So in today's lecture, we want to focus on the plant kingdom or kingdom plantae. Plants are multicellular organisms. They are autotrophs. So in other words, they are producers. Um, examples of plants, moss, sperm, gymnosperms, angiosperms, which we will talk about those in a little more detail later on in this lecture. So plants are divided into four general categories, and the division of categories is based upon the presence or absence of certain key features. So we'll talk about categories called bryophytes, seedless vascular plants, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. So there are plants located in waters, but there are also plants located on land, which certainly we're familiar with because we see them almost every day uh, of our lives. Plants actually, these plants that we see on land are actually thought to have evolved from green algae. So green algae is thought to have given rise to more complex plants. There are two broad categories of green algae. Charophytes, which are said to be most commonly related to land plants, as well as chlorophytes. So again, these plants are said to have evolved and in that evolutionary process, if you will, uh, the plants developed certain adaptations that made them uh, suitable to being able to live on land. So let's talk just a little bit about this green algae. So green algae actually can perform photosynthesis just like the land plants that we are accustomed to seeing. They're able to perform photosynthesis because they have chloroplasts. Now, if you recall, chloroplasts are actually a type of organelle that are located inside of plants and they have a um, photosynthetic pigment called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is located, as you recall, in the thylakoids. And if we have stacks of thylakoids, those are called grana. The two broad categories of green algae being chlorophyte or chlorophyta and charophytes or charophyta. So I want to stop and bring your attention to one specific type of green algae called 
spirogyra. I bring this to your attention because spirogyra is commonly found in a lot of uh, freshwater habitats like ponds and lakes, and it's commonly studied in labs as well because the structure stands out so well when looking uh, at pond water through a microscope. So spirogyra is a free-floating green algae. It's present in freshwater habitats such as ponds and lakes. It's also commonly known as water silk or pond silk. It has a filamentous and unbranched vegetated, vegetative type structure. So here is an animated depiction of spirogyra and its structure. And there are very component, various components of the structure we're gonna talk a little bit about. And some of those structures that I want you to make sure you're familiar with, number one, the pyranoid, which uh, plays a role in carbon fixation and it stores starch for energy. Now, if you remember, we talked about carbon fi fixation earlier and there being various types. There was uh, C3, C4, and CAM plants. And these types of fixations were used to conserve energy and water. And if you recall, the CAM plants only would open their stomata at nighttime. So again, this was their way of preserving energy and water to help them survive, especially in very dry climates. So in spirogyra, the pyranoid plays a role. The pyranoid plays a role in carbon fixation. There is a structure called mucilage. Mucilage is actually on the outside of the structure. It serves as a lubricant, so therefore it makes the spirogyra slimy. This is a protective mechanism. It protects it from various animals and pathogens, this slimy exterior or mucilage. There's a cell wall, there's a central vacuole. And the only thing I really want you to know about the central vacuole is that is where the nucleus is actually located or suspended. And it's suspended by these attachments called cytoplasm strands. Okay, and just like with other living organisms, the nucleus is where we will find the genetic information for these plants. So again, as previously stated, we're going to talk about two classes or categories of green algae, chlorophytes. Now, chlorophytes is one, the other one being charophytes. Chlorophytes are algae, usually live as single cells like Chlamydomonas or in colonies like Volvox. So, Chlamydomonas, Volvox. They are usually found in both fresh and salt water, and some species are known to live in very cold Arctic snowbanks. Now, the second category of green algae, charophytes, these are the ones that are thought to be most commonly related to plants. So therefore indicating that land plants as we know them may have originated from charophytes. So they made some adaptations, uh, developed and advanced and became uh, land plants. Now charophytes are said to be co-inocytic, co-inocytic. So remember that term. Co-inocytic simply means that these plants contain multiple or numerous chloroplasts. They also contain multiple or numerous nuclei. They've adapted to very low light conditions because they live at the bottom of these uh, oceans, seas, lakes, or wherever it is they may be located. So again, when talking about charophytes, remember that these are the ones that are most closely related to land plants. Charophytes are the algae most closely related to land plants. They are co-inocytic, which means they contain numerous chloroplasts and nuclei. So make sure you remember that. And that they are also adapted to low light, which of course is very necessary for their survival since they were getting limited sunlight and they need to get sunlight as their form of energy in order to perform photosynthesis. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but what I do want to point out is this particular description here talking about charophytes and bring to your attention that there are different types of charophytes. And most specifically, I want to look at streptophytes, which again is a type of charophyte. And these 
particular species of charophytes are thought to be the species from which land plants developed. Okay, and again, embryophytes are land plants that are evolved from streptophyte green algae. So just to kind of put things in perspective as to how possibly we look at the evolution of plants, that plants started or many plants started as green algae. And from there, they developed various adaptations and grew, evolved and became land plants from which again, they diversified into various other species. So when we talk about this development, we also have to talk about plant diversity and plant diversity simply just means that there are all different types plant species, and we know that already. But we're going to specifically talk about bryophytes, seedless vascular plants, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. Again, plant diversity simply just means there are various species, numerous species of plants. And we want to look at those different species or different categories of species and just Take a moment to see what those characteristics are. So as I stated previously, these plants or land plants have several adaptations that make living on land suitable for them. They grow upright, they have vascular tissue, they're able to retain water. Uh, of course, they have to have mechanisms by which they can survive and reproduce. And we already talked just a little bit about carbon fixation. Now, I want to back up and focus on this word here, vascular. Anytime we see the word vascular, generally that has to do kind of like with a vein type system. Just as we have veins and arteries, so that is our vascular tissue, our veins and order, arteries that allow blood to flow throughout our body and provide nutrients to other parts of the body. Similarly, Plants have a vascular tissue or a vascular system, which allows water, mineral, nutrients to flow throughout the plant. So again, vascular tissue allows water and minerals to flow throughout the plant. Let me state that again. The vascular tissue of the plant allows water, minerals, food to flow throughout the plant so that it can be nourished for survival and eventually reproduction. So let's talk a little bit about water retention in plants. We know that if we don't water our plants or if our grass doesn't get enough water, it will dry, it will die. And so the plants have adapted in such a manner that they have mechanisms in place to retain water, but also to just to be able to retrieve water from the soil. So on the leaves, one of these adaptations in terms of uh, water retention is this, what's called a waxy cuticle. And it's an outside covering on the plant and it allows the leaves to be protected from drying conditions. Also too, water. Well, how do plants get water? They absorb water through their roots. Now, if you recall, we have talked several times about the adhesive properties of water and the cohesive properties of water. In the cohesive property of water, remember this, that means that water molecules have the ability to stick to each other, stick to other water molecules. But the adhesive property of water allows water to stick to other things. So that's very important in this particular case when we're talking about plants and how they're able to obtain water. Plants obtain water through their roots. So how does it get into the roots? Adhesive property of water. The water is able to stick to the molecules of the roots of the plant. So it is absorbed through the roots via adhesive property. Remember that plants are able to absorb water through their roots because of the adhesive property of water. Let me say that again. Plants are able to absorb water from soil through their roots 
because of the adhesive property of water. So we've talked about photosynthesis several times now in several lectures. So it's old hat material where the plants need a form of energy. That form of energy is sunlight and it also captures carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we know that via the adhesive property of water, that plants will absorb water from the soil through its roots. So during the process of photosynthesis, we need sunlight, which is the form of energy needed to drive this reaction forward. We need carbon dioxide or the plants need carbon dioxide, which they are able to absorb through, well, not absorb, but able to obtain through their leaves, most specifically through these pores in the leaves called stomata, okay? And the other thing, again, we just talked about was that there's a waxy coating on the outside of plants called the cuticles. And that also is a protective factor adaptation, if you will, that keeps these leaves from drying out based upon the conditions of the external atmosphere. So just to recap, stomata being those pores, okay, that are located on the leaves, and specifically on the underside of the leaf that allows gas exchange. And what gas are we talking about? Well, we're talking about carbon dioxide. That is certainly a gas needed for photosynthesis, but we're also talking about the release of waste products or the waste gas, which is oxygen. So gas exchange, in other words, obtaining the carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere and releasing the waste product oxygen back into the atmosphere, we call that process gas exchange. So gas exchange, fact to remember, gas exchange, when we're talking about plants, is just referring to acquiring or obtaining carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releasing oxygen as a waste product into the atmosphere. Gas exchange in plants is referring to obtaining carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then releasing the waste product of photosynthesis, which is oxygen, back into the atmosphere. And this is made possible or facilitated by these pores on the underside of the leaf called the stomata. So we've already talked about the fact that roots serve a purpose or serve a function of allowing the plants to be able to absorb water from the soil based upon its uh, characteristic adhesive property. But roots also serve to kind of anchor or stabilize the plant in the soil. So again, this particular adaptation of land plants, the roots, allows the plant to be able to obtain water and minerals from the soil. And of course, being able to obtain or absorb that water is based upon the adhesive property of water. But the roots also serve to anchor or stabilize the plant, keep it in place so that, again, it can stand upright and be stable. So the next adaptation in these land plants that I want to discuss is the vascular tissue. And as I stated just a brief moment ago, this vascular tissue serves as the transport system within the plants. The vascular tissue serves as the transport system within the plants. And it's composed of bundles of tubes. And these tubes, again, serves as kind of like the veins in our uh, body that blood can flow through to distribute, you know, needed, uh, needed nutrients, etc. throughout the body. Now, the roots need the food produced at the leaves, and the leaves need the material that the roots absorb from the soil, that material being both water and other minerals. There are two different types of vascular tissue, that being the xylem, and the phloem. So again, this vascular tissue, remember there are two types, the xylem and the phloem. 
serve as the, the transport system for plants and the transport of various nutrients, minerals, and water. Okay. So the xylem, most specifically, is responsible for the transport of water from the roots to the plant, whereas the phloem is responsible for the transport of food from the leaves to the plant. So again, the two types of vascular tissue that you need to remember are the xylem and the phloem. Xylem being responsible for the transport of water, whereas the phloem is responsible for the transport of food. In other words, nutrients and minerals throughout the plant. So as with any living organism, and a plant is a living organism, in order to su survive and sustain life, the plants have to reproduce. So land plants make gametes, and remember we talked about gametes being those um, sex cells. So female gamete being the egg and the male gamete being the sperm. So land, gamete, land plants make gametes that can survive and find each other on land. Now, specifically we say find each other because it is not say the type of direct sexual reproduction that we're accustomed to in terms of humans and other animals. Sometimes it has to be facilitated by other means, be it another animal, specifically say insects like bees, butterflies, etc., or just being carried by the wind or traveling through water. They make embryos that are protected from drying out. Now, remember when we talked about embryos, we talked about the fertilization of an egg by the sperm and that end result now the fertilized eggs becomes the zygote from which an embryo develops and eventually becomes a person, fully grown person. Well, similarly in plants, after fertilization, you'll have the development of an embryo, but this embryo has to be protected uh, from drying out. Just like when we have sexual reproduction, the embryo is protected by some means, but you know, it's protected internally by this sac that contains amniotic fluid. So plants have their adaptations as well to protect their embryos. So we talked a little bit earlier, as well as in a couple of previous lectures about pollination. So seed plants produce pollen, which contains the male gamete, which is sperm, and we see that in gymnosperms and angiosperms, and we'll talk about what those are a little bit later. Pollination can occur without water because oftentimes pollination occurs through an insect actually carrying the pollen from one plant or one part of the plant to another part of the plant, which is going to be the receptive part or the female gamete being generally the egg, but we learn that, you know, you have stigma and stamen. So with the male portion being the stamen, where the pollen is produced and that pollen will stick to an insect and then that insect will carry it to the female portion, which is the stigma and deposit it there. So you may actually recognize this slide from the two previous lectures when we talked about sexu sexual reproduction in plants. Pollination is just basically the act of transferring pollen grains from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma. So again, the goal of every living organism is to reproduce, to create offspring. Remember, we learned that another word for offspring is progeny, P-R-O-G-E-N-Y. So offspring is the same thing as progeny, which is the same thing as a child. Okay, so pollen from the plant stamen, which is the male portion, sticks to the body of the pollinator. In this case, the pollinator is a bee. The pollinator then carries the pollen to another plant and it's deposited in the receiving plant. Okay, now here you'll see that the stamen actually is made up of two components, 
the anther and the filament. And again, the pollen grains are produced in this area. So, you know, many of us recognize, especially when it comes down to say like fruit and vegetables, that there are seeds and you plant the seeds in the ground and these fruits, vegetables, what have you will grow. So seeds actually carry the dormant plant embryos. So in other words, these fertilized uh, uh, products, if you will, now that have developed into embryos are actually contained within the seed. And when we see the word dormant, that basically means lying asleep, kind of a hibernation, if you will. And the interesting thing about this is the plant is very self-sufficient. These seeds also package a food supply and it protects the embryo and the food supply, if you will, but most certainly the embryo from drying out. These seeds can be dispersed long distances. They remain dormant until conditions are favorable. So generally there's enough food supplied within these seeds that lasts for a while and until you actually plant them, water them, and they begin to germinate, G-E-R-M-I-N-A-T-E, -E, so grow and develop, they'll lie dormant, so sleep, kind of like a hibernation. And we see that certainly in the category of plants called gymnosperms and angiosperms. So plant flowers and fruit, uh, let's talk just a little bit about that. Flowers produce reproductive structures, pollen, egg cells, we've talked about that. Okay, fruits develop after fertilization to protect and disperse the plant offspring. So we see that in angiosperms. And again, as I stated, the seed actually is where we see the plant embryo. And again, it is stored with its own food so that it can survive until it is planted and then begins to develop or to germinate. G-E-R-M-I-N-A-T-E, -E, germinate. So basically the development of this plant, growth and development. In a couple of previous lectures, we talked about types of asexual reproduction. We talked about binary fission, which occurs in prokaryotes, which is just a splitting of the cell. But we also talked about in terms of plants that there can be um, spores produced as well as vegetative reproduction. Now, spores, example that's used here, fern leaves, and they're located on the underside of the fern, as well as a vegetative reproduction where new plants grow from stems, roots, or leaves. So again, these are types of asexual reproduction that occurs in plants. And we're gonna talk certainly a little bit more about spores. So if you recall in our previous two lectures, we talked a little bit about cell duplication and replication, the processes involved in that, and what the genetic material looked like. And if you recall in mitosis, we see that mitosis actually occurred in somatic cells, S-O-M-A-T-I-C, and then meiosis occurred in germ cells, which is the same thing as sex cells. Well, we have some similar processes that occur in plants as well, but I also want to talk about these structures that are in plants that are called sporophytes and gametophytes. Now, sporophyte is a diploid structure that participates in asexual plant reproduction. Diploid is referring to the chromosomes, that genetic material, and remember the structure of the chromosome, that X-type structure with the short arm and the long arm, and then you have the sister chromatids that are connected by that compressed DNA called the centromere. And the diploid structure is representing that complement or that full amount of DNA or genetic material that is obtained from two different parents. So that's a diploid structure. Whereas the gametophyte in plants is a haploid structure, which participates in the sexual reproduction. So look at the similarity of the words of gamete, 
which we know is our germ cell or sex cell and gametophyte, okay, which participates in sexual reproduction. Now, the gametophyte is a haploid structure. So in other words, single chromosome. Remember my meiosis where you have the sex cells exiting the cell cycle and now going into meiosis and it goes through a division two times, two division cycles, and you wind up with those four haploid cells, those four daughter cells. Well, that's kind of what we're seeing here with the gametophyte. It's a haploid structure. So that single chromosome as opposed to the double or dual chromosomes that we see here in a diploid structure. So plants are said to alternate their generations and it's called alternation of generations. And that's because they will alternate between a sporophyte and gametophyte type generation. And remember, we just said that the sporophyte generation is diploid and it is involved in that asexual portion, whereas the gametophyte, which is haploid, is actually involved or associated with the um, sexual reproduction. So both are multicellular plants that carry out life. Now, we kind of mentioned the term diversity of plants earlier and there being different types, just meaning different species of plants. But even though plant life is diverse, different species, they pretty much all have similar life cycles. Plant zygotes grow into adult sporophyte plants and produce spores. Uh, plant spores grow into adult gametophyte plants and produce gametes. And again, this sporophyte and gametophyte and actually producing spores and then the spores now transitioning to grow into adult gametophytes. Again, this refers to the previous slide of alternation of generations. So let's look a little more closely at these uh, different types of plants, so the diversity of plants. So bryophytes are the simplest types of plants, and this includes mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. They live in shady, mo moist habitats uh, where they help build the soil that larger plants use. They don't have a vascular system. So remember, we talked about that vascular system of the phloem and the xylem. They tend to be very small. They do, however, um, have nutrients or are able to obtain nutrients via diffusion and osmosis. And if you remember earlier in the semester, we talked about, you know, diff diffusion and osmosis and uh, basically diffusion moving from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration, and then osmosis being a similar process, but most specifically just applying to water. These bryophytes don't have roots or leaves, okay? And one type of bryophyte are rhizoids. So bryophytes are very small. They have a small sporophyte. The sporophyte is basically just a stalk attached to the gametophyte. Remember our alternation of generations. You start off with a sporophyte, and that sporophyte now can produce spores that, um, again, will develop. And then we get the gametophyte stage, which are the actual gametes or germ cells. Sporophytes produce spores that grow into new haploid gametophyte plants. So bryophytes reproduce in water. And so since they do reproduce in water, water serves a vital role in their reproductive process. Now the gametes formed by mitosis in these bryophytes in separate sperm and egg cells, uh, gametophytes, have, again, these uh, structures that will actually produce the germ cells. And the sperm, in this particular case, in order to fertilize the eggs, since these bryophytes do reproduce in water, the sperm actually swims to the egg cell in a film of water that coats the plant. So in bryophytes, sperm swim to the eggs. So if I were to ask, 
how do bryophytes reproduce? They reproduce in water and the sperm actually swims to the egg. Again, how do bryophytes reproduce? Bryophytes reproduce in water where the sperm actually swims to the egg for the fertilization process. So the next category of plants we want to talk about are what are called seedless vascular plants. So seedless, in other words, less without seeds, but they are vascular. So in other words, they do have a phloem and xylem vascular tissue serve as transport for water, nutrients, minerals, etc. In this category, we see ferns and you know close relatives of ferns club mosses, horsetails, whisk ferns. They uh, <clears throat> primarily live in shady, moist habitats. Again, they do have a vascular transport system. And when I say vascular transport, I'm referring to those tubes that are located that will transport water and minerals. And that vascular system is comprised of two different types of tissue, that being the xylem and the phloem. They also have root and leaf system, but they do not have seeds. So that's why they're called seedless vascular plants. So these seedless vascular plants, again, they don't have seeds, but they do have roots, stems, and leaves. The vascular tissue, and when I say vascular tissue, I'm referring to the xylem and the phloem. Vascular tissue allows these plants to grow much larger than bryophytes, which gives them an edge on competing for sunlight. So the bryophytes are very small, but seedler vascular plants are much larger than the, bio, than the uh, bryophytes. These seedless vascular plants have a large sporophyte. The sporophyte grows up and out of the gametophyte. And as it matures, it detaches and grows separately, then produces the spores. And again, these are the spores here on the underside of this fern leaf. So seedless vascular plants do require water for reproduction. Gametophytes produce male and female gametes. And we know that gametes um, are germ cells, you know, the sperm in the male and the egg in the female. The sperm actually swims from the male to the female gametophytes in water. So similar to bryophytes, seedless vascular plants also uh, reproduce in the water and the sperm actually swims from the male to the female. So both bryophytes and seedless vascular plants actually require water for reproduction where the sperm swims from the male to the female gametophytes in water. So let's talk about the category of plants called gymnosperms. Gymnosperms have seeds and they produce pollen. The gymnosperm seeds are said to be naked. Gymnosperms live in diverse habitats. So anywhere from mountainsides to grassy areas and what have you, uh, they, they are diverse structures, various different types of woody type plant, I mean, woody type trees. So again, gymnosperms, they can live in various types of habitats and gymnosperms, again, are very diverse in their structures as well. And remember that the seeds of the gymnosperms are considered naked. So gymnosperm, gymnosperms are a very diverse group. And uh, they also vary in their reproductive structures and their leaf types. So we're gonna look at cycads and conifers, which produce cones to reproduce. So cycads tend to live in more tropical areas, even though we tend to plant tropical plants almost anywhere now. Uh, but cycads are actually near extension. They slow very, they, they uh, grow very slowly. Um, their habitats are shrinking, and they're considered to be ornamental type plants. So in other words, kind of decorative, something nice to look at. So cycads are tropical and they're ornamental. So just nice to look at. So the two characteristics, the only thing I really want you to remember about cycads are they are tropical and they are ornamental. Cycads are tropical 
and ornamental. Ginkgo biloba is another plant type. You know, it has fan-shaped leaves. But the thing that we'll actually retain when it comes to talking about ginkgo colopa, uh, biloba is uh, memory retention and medication. So again, many of us are familiar with various nutrients, health supplements, and what have you. And they will even produce it like as a pill, ginkgo biloba. And one of the things that is said to be or play some role in is memory retention. So just remember that when we're talking about ginkgo, biloba, and any potential characteristics or properties or practical applications for um, this particular plant is it is used sometimes for memory retention or certainly marketed as being relevant for memory retention. The next plant that we will talk about or a type of plant that we'll talk about that is also a gymnosperm are the conifers. Conifers have needle-like leaves. They produce cones. They're evergreen, which means they generally stay green all the time, unlike some trees uh, that, you know, leaves will turn brown or whatever. Generally, conifers are uh, green all year round, so that's why they are called uh, conif uh, evergreens. They are also used for lumber, and you know we'll see them being used for Christmas trees like pine trees. So the thing that I want you to remember about conifers is they produce cones as part of their reproductive process. They are evergreens, and they are very useful in terms of being uh, manufactured or going through manufacturing processes for lumber. So conifers produce cones as part of their reproductive process. They are always green, typically. Uh, so they're called evergreens. They're green year round, so they're called evergreens. And they are a very important resource of lumber and we use it for Christmas trees. So if I ask you to name three characteristics of con conifers, you can name any of these, needle-like leaves, cones, evergreens, used for lumber, and we use them for Christmas trees. Another type of uh, gymnospore is called netophytes. This G is silent, netophytes. They also have uh, cones that resemble flowers. They're very similar to the next category we'll talk about, which are angiosperms. So gymnosperm sporophytes are very large, very conspicuous. In other words, you know, obvious. The sporophytes of most gymnosperms are woody trees or shrubs. They produce both male and female cones. So again, gymnosperms are very large as opposed to, say, the bryophytes, which are very small. And the sporophytes of most gymnosperms are woody trees or shrubs, and they produce both male and female cones. Gymnosperm cones develop into tiny gametophytes. Pollen containing sperm is formed in the male cone, and ovules containing eggs are formed in the female cones. So we had already talked a few slides earlier about seeds being protected um, by, you know, various outside coats and uh, the seeds protect the actual embryo. So gymnosperm seeds have a tough outer coat and can be dispersed by wind or animals. When conditions are favorable, they will germinate into seedlings which develop into mature sporophyte trees. So remember, I had mentioned this word germinate earlier, just basically meaning the development of the seeds, the growth and development of the seeds, okay? So now let's talk about angiosperms. Angiosperms are those plants or trees that produce um, seeds and fruit. Angiosperms produce pollen and egg cells in flowers, which develop into fruit after fertilization. So angiosperms produce pollen and egg cells in flowers, and these flowers eventually develop into fruit after fertilization. 
So the angiosperm flowers are sporophyte reproductive structures. The angiosperm flowers are sporophyte reproductive structures. Pollen sacs in flowers produce male gametophytes. The ovule in the flower produces female gametophytes. So once again, angiosperm flowers are sporophyte reproductive structures. And the pollen sacs in flowers produce the male gametophyte and the ovule in flowers produce the female gametophyte. So let's remember this cell, this slide, I'm sorry. Angiosperm flowers are sporophyte reproductive structures. Pollen sacs in flowers produce male gametophytes. The ovule in the flower produces female gametophytes. So one of the unique things about angiosperms is they have a double fertilization. So two sperm nuclei travel through the pollen tube. One fertilizes the egg forming a zygote. This is the first cell of the sporophyte. The other sperm fertilizes the central cell's polar nuclei. This will develop into the endosperm, which feeds the embryo inside the cell, because inside the seed, I'm sorry, because as you recall, I said that these seeds will lie dormant and they're protecting the embryo. So not only is the embryo stored, there is food that is stored as well. And this food that is stored is in the form of what is called an endosperm. So this endosperm actually feeds the embryo while it's lying dormant or in its hibernation stage, if you will. So this is a lot of information regarding different types of plants and what have you. And I'm going to post review questions over just some key points that I want you to remember regarding this presentation. And uh, as you will recall in the announcement that I made in class, these review questions, yes, are uh, designed to help reinforce the information so that you learn some key concepts, but it will also be a graded assignment. Enjoy the rest of your day.